the Evolution Security Podcast. Welcome to the Evolution Security Podcast, where we give you the knowledge and live training to protect yourself, your family, and your country. Our hosts are Eric Davis, Aaron Davis, and myself, Brian Schilt. This show is brought to you in part by Tenacore. Tenacore manufactures holsters and weapon retention systems that work. We suggest that you check out the Velo 4 AWIB holster. We don't only recommend it, we also use them daily. Find them at tenacore.com. That's T E N I C O R. Use EvoSec at checkout for 10% off. That's E V O S E C at checkout for 10% off. Also, if you'd like to find us online, look for us on Instagram at EvoSec USA, Facebook at EvoSec USA, and our website, E V O S E C dot O R G. That's evosec.org. And now also on Patreon at Evosec USA. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash Evosec USA. We would love to see donations and are working on benefits for benefactors. You build on your failure, you use it as a stepping stone, close the door on the past. You don't try to forget the mistakes, but you don't dwell on it. You don't let it have any of your energy or any of your time or any of your space. Now, guys, when I hear that quote, you know, it it sounds like it could be Brian Enos or maybe Lenny Basham. But that is actually the American legend Johnny Cash. And uh, I thought that was a really cool quote because... Sounds like he's talking about building on failure in, in your jujitsu and your um, in your shooting and and other martial arts endeavors. But you know, of course, this is going to be a different show. Everybody, um, I'm starting out with a Johnny Cash quote because we're going to hit on some important self defense current events here in a bit. But we are going to take this show in a decidedly non tactical way because we felt that we wanted to have a um, lighthearted show uh, between the three of us and we're going to have a long chat about one of my favorite topics music until we get there eric did you have something you wanted to bring up buddy roger thanks Aaron. man that quote is is awesome by the way i thought of the same thing you know it cannot be a more fitting quote for both this show and for what we do in EvoSec. And and yeah, I I like that a lot, man. That's going to be hung up next to my desk. So with that said, audience uh, members out there, we would like to hear a lot more from you guys and have a lot more interaction. We haven't to this point, just the way the show's been set up, but we would like to hear from you guys. So if you want to contact us with questions, any discussion you'd like to have or even subjects for shows you'd like to see or hear, um, please contact us at crew at evosec.org. That's crew, C-R-E-W, at evosec.org. Yeah, please drop us a line out there. Th- thanks a lot, Aaron. You're welcome. Guys, It's it's been a little while since we've seen each other here. I'm... Um, I'm glad to see you guys there. We've got our Skype call and video. We're always so far away, but it, this is a lot of fun we, when we get to hang out and chat. How are you doing there, Brian? Awesome, awesome. Man, it's, uh, like you say, it is really good to get together and do this. It's I miss it when we don't, so it's pretty cool to do this. You know, guys, I kind of feel like I have to say something. You know, when we've got new listeners and we've got people kind of driving by and 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 seeing the topics that we have and 
and our company, Evolution Security, you know, we, I feel sometimes like, you know, there is kind of a tendency that some people will look at someone or listen to someone say, what do you guys have to offer? What's your expertise in this area? Well, for the most part, we are average guys. We we do have above average skills in a lot of these areas, but the main thing is circling back to the reason why we have this show is that we're going to bring along other average people and we're going to try and all get above average together. But I just felt like saying that um, since it's we've been at it here for a while and it's been a long time since we've, um, you know, really introduced ourselves and, and talked about our backgrounds. But the true experts that come on this show are the guests that we have. And they're the ones that we learn from and we trust. And, and heck, we've learned a lot from them, too. And we, we want to pass that on, too. But I just felt like I'm making that clear. What do you guys think? Absolutely, Aaron. It's... Um, and we've actually gotten some feedback in that direction where, although we are just average guys with normal jobs, um, we do these other things in addition to try to get better. And our intent is to do this to help share that with other people. So that's really the point, I think, of what we're doing. What do you got to say, bro? Well, um, what I'd say, guys, is that the feedback we get on our input is actually pretty cool because um, we do kind of feel like that sometimes it's like you know we we are guys that that train we train hard and and we have you know years of a background in what we espouse but we do get we do get the opportunity to have incredible guests and you know that that can kind of be our focus at times but you know we do believe that we have things to offer our audience. And, you know, the, the main thing is that I get feedback from is, is our accountability, you know, that we do at the end of the show. So, you know, that's always a great part of the show that, that really helps um, us connect, you know, the three of us in, in our venture together and helps us stay accountability to ourselves first, meaning amongst uh, the EvoSec crew, um, but then also to to our audience members that we are actually, you know, training and what we espouse. So, uh, again, when I see you guys on film this far away or film, I should say video, um, it's very, very um, joyful to me. So uh, I'm glad to be here. Awesome. Well, hey, Brian, I, I think we're going to start some of these these topics out that we're going to touch on. Um, you want to go ahead and, and delve us into the self-defense story? Yep. We haven't done one of these in a little while because we've been doing some uh, larger interviews where I didn't really feel like we had time, but we're going to bring one to you uh, this week from uh, Memphis WREG News 3 is who uh, posted this story. So that's who we're giving credit for the story, but it's from uh, Hughes, Arkansas. A burglary suspect is recovering after being shot while another is on the run after they tried to break into a man's house twice. Thieves broke into 80-year-old Fred Burka's house two nights in a row. Early Monday morning, he heard noises and found two men taking his 55-inch flat-screen TV. They ran out of the house, Burka said, and then I looked again and my TV was gone. Burka boarded up his front door with a wooden board, hoping it would prevent a future break-in. Neighbors say they saw two men circling the block just hours later. One neighbor said they were watching Burkus' house very closely. Burkus says the thieves struck again around 2 a.m. on Tuesday. They climbed through a back window, and he says they tried to get into his bedroom. Burkus says they started asking him where his money was. He began pushing against the door to keep them out, but when they started threatening him, he took action. I reached and got my shotgun, Burkus said. Burkus shot one suspect in his bedroom doorway while the other ran off. Hughes police says both suspects are juveniles with histories of prior break-ins. The one who was shot is still recovering. Burkus will not face charges, but it is sad local teens are resorting to crime. I don't feel good at all, Burkus said. I'm 80 years old. If he had gotten in there, I don't know what he would have done. His neighbors say they will be keeping an eye out for Burkus. At this time, no charges have been filed in this case. 
So pretty uh, interesting scenario there. You got a, a guy who's actually been broken into once, takes a little measures and fortifying his home and still doesn't work and has to resort to, you know, using a weapon to defend himself. And I would say fortunate for him, he had it. Um, what do you think, Aaron? Well, the, one of the things that stands out to me is that he was able to use a really good tactic, which is the the fatal funnel of a door. The, the key there is that, you know, if there is no reason for you to leave your bedroom or any other safe room in your house, you just call the police and get prepared if they make it through that door. And this gentleman, he, he used that to his advantage. So that that was... To me, I mean, that that's an excellent tactic. And a lot of people, unfortunately, when they hear something go bump in the night, they think they want to go and check it out. But as we've talked to Craig Douglas about regarding his Amos class, that's the last thing you probably ever want to do. So how about you, Eric? Aaron, I, I'm going to double down. I could not say it any better regarding the tactic. Um, we probably want to hit home on that every single time that we can is that the number one tactic for you to adhere to or SOP um, when you when you do hear somebody break into your house, if that's what you believe is going on, if you do not have to get to children or to some other portion of your house, your best option is to, um, you know, of course, call 911, like Aaron said, and and have your firearm with you, but have a point of cover inside your room. That's something that our audience needs to do is, you know, if it's a bookshelf or, or whatever you set up that can sustain rounds, that you can sit and wait on whomever might be trying to, to, to get to you or get to your goods so that you own essentially the high ground. So, so Keep that tact in it, tactic in mind, folks. I mean, that that's your best bet. Now, if you want to get, if you have children, maybe your best uh, hole at point is your children's room. You know that they mm-hmm. have a safe space within that room, and that your point of cover is in your children's room. So you got to get there first, and then that's where you hold your high ground is at your at your children's room. So, um, just my thoughts on it. These, um, it was teenagers, right? They were still pretty darn bold because they came back a second night and knew that they were going to try and get into the guy's bedroom. So, you know, th- those are some fairly determined um, criminals right there. So, again, yeah, being prepped for that, holding down, I mean, definitely a great tactic on his end. And, of course, have to mention, too, I think like you said, Eric, they were seen casing the guy's house, right? But in the end, we've got an, it has to be said, too, we've got an 80-year-old gentleman who had a firearm to equalize um, the force continuum between he and these, um, these way more fit juveniles. Any other thoughts on that, guys? Yeah, I, I think I'm good on that. Let's go ahead and segue into the next topic, which is the coronavirus, which seems to have a, a lot of, you know, folks really scared out there. And, you know, we're, we're trying to, to be pragmatic and, and uh, you know, not get too uh, panicky about that. I mean, it is serious. Obviously, it seems to be spreading pretty quick, but um, it looks like, the flu, the, 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 the typical flu each year kills more people than the coronavirus. I think the, the main issue is that at least there's a vaccination for, for the flu. Bottom line, I think uh, my biggest uh, preventive measure is that, you know, I don't like doing it, but, but you know, I stopped shaking a lot of people's hands uh, where I'm currently traveling. You know, it's probably smart for me to do so. And I keep hand sanitizer with me. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to be smart about it. I'm not ready to, to go into wearing a mask yet. I know my wife might feel like she might want to, you know, but, um, you know, she's, she's been monitoring it better than I. But, uh, 
Um, What's your thoughts on it, Brian? Well, being at uh, ground zero, (laughs) uh, you know, I'm in Washington and Washington is where, you know, we've had the first deaths, et cetera. But the biggest deal is, and, you know, hopefully your wife will hear this too. If you're not sick, you don't need to wear a mask. That's really the biggest deal is if if you have symptoms or you're sick, you, you should protect other people from you. That's the biggest deal. And the other thing is, wash your hands. You know what? Wash your hands and use uh, standard procedures. You'll be fine. I actually saw a segment with Dr. Drew today, and he uh, he was basically telling the media to shut up in the in those certain terms. You guys need to shut up. You're scaring people. You're getting people wound up. Um, I don't know. I really doubt that this is occurring in other parts of the country, but um, locally here, Oregon, Washington. We've had Costco's sell out of water, sell out of toilet paper completely, sell out of hand sanitizing wipes. And it's like, folks, this is not a big deal. And there's nothing wrong with being prepared should you, you know, a family member or something, you know, get infected where you need to stay home from work for a week or something. Yeah, you should have a little extra food. You might want to have a case of water in the closet. You don't need a pallet of water. You don't need... 900 rolls of toilet paper. That's that's not going to get you through this. <laughs> so just be smart, guys. You know, it's, uh, you know, we wanted to talk about this to really make people listen to some reason because there's there's just some crazy behavior I've been seeing here locally. How about uh, out there in the Midwest, Aaron? You know, interesting enough, literally right before we got on here to record, my wife comes in and says, hey, I just um, got a text from my mom saying that your pastor, our pastor, and his um, one of his colleagues is now quarantined here in in around the Edmond, Oklahoma area. And so my pastor, our church is probably because of how many satellite um, churches we have. It's more than likely the biggest church in the United States. It just kind of hits home a little bit that, you know, here's here's at least I know that they don't have the virus, but at the same time, making some news about my pastor being quarantined. And it's because he was in a at some conference in Germany and and they stopped him on the way back and said, you're going to have to self quarantine. And they're even holed up by themselves and not even being around their family, etc. But to me. First off, and then I'll get to to what I've been doing because of this, but the main thing to me is that, you know, we don't want to discount people that are sick and the people that have died in the country, but it really is kind of weird to me that it's as if the, the sky is falling on this particular issue when... Rightly so. I mean, in defense of the president and, and, you know, Rush Limbaugh talking about, hey, guys, this is about like the flu. Well, it sure as heck sounds like it to me. I mean, I th- don't you guys think? Oh, absolutely. If you show me healthy adult males dialing large numbers, I'll be worried. The only people that have died here in Washington had other underlying health effects, and that would be true if it was the normal flu. This is no magic <laughs> you know, silver bullet virus. 100%. That's what I noticed too. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the type of people, unfortunately that are dying the same as whenever they get the flu. But, you know, even though I don't believe this is going to turn out to be like, you know, um, what was that movie a few years ago with, with Will Smith and there are all the the (laughs) zombies running around and he had this, yeah, I, I am legend. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, every now and then it pops in my head, man, what what if that happened, you know? Yeah, am I yeah. going to put when, when the infected on that my... have died come back to life, then we've got a problem. Yeah, that, that has not yeah. happened. <laughs> and and then you know, they're talking about on the news they're they're about to start testing on human um subjects. It's like, "No, that's what happened in <laughs> in I'm legend. <laughs> that's how it started." <laughs> <laughs> well, Aaron, Aaron, if I can interject, you know, um, I was joking with my wife and <clears throat> Nick, our son, also said something similar. I told her, I said, well, babe, just remember 
shoot the zombies in the face. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, go ahead. But but you know I, you know it is it is all in jest, <clears throat> you know of course. But you were going to say though, Aaron, I think you're going to. You have to have that, that special um, zombie max two two three rounds. Oh know, yeah, the, the ones with tip. the green tips. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean <laughs> it, it makes it more effective, guys. Yeah. <laughs> We went off on a tangent, didn't we? Yeah. Well, hey, if if I can say something serious though, Brian, on something that you said, you know, it should not take a, a you know an issue like this for folks to have some emergency prep. You know. Yes. And what I mean by that is, like you said, it doesn't take a pallet of 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 water and pallet of of food, but you know, you should have at a minimum, several days worth of food and water um, to be able to deal with lack of power or any emergency. You know, my, my wife and I consistently keep, you know, over a month's worth of stores that that, that, that we're going to do okay. But, you know, folks that go out during a crisis, you know, that should be a, a signal to those folks just to kind of, you know, have some of that stuff ready to go. You yeah. Know, during well, issues like this. So... I'm going to shame myself right now. This, even though I don't think this is, is you know, um, I am legend point, right? But I have not, I've had a little bit of um, of items, you know, for emergencies, but I am not as prepared as I should be. So not preparing for this, but it made me think, okay, I need to at least start buying a few things here and there. So so I'm buying a few things, you know, some storable food and and some extra water, and some of the things that you usually don't think about, like like soap and um, wet wipes and and of course batteries. But the thing is that that I don't really hear in, at least I have not heard that much is prepping, especially if it let's just say heaven forbid that you have to be holed up for a month, two months. I have medications, prescription medications that I would be in really bad shape if I didn't have them. And I mean, what are we supposed to do in that instance, right? I mean, have you guys thought about that? I mean, because it's not like you can go to your pharmacy and your doctor and say, hey, I need to stock up just in case the the zombies come. Well, I wouldn't use the word zombies, (laughs) but... (laughs) You can actually request supplemental uh, medication, and in the form of narcotics, they're probably going to deny it. But uh, I do, um, when I leave country or go out of area for longer periods like backpacking, um, I will actually usually carry an antibiotic with me, and you know that's a discussion to have with your doctor. I'm not going to call anything out, but... Uh, they will write those for you and, you know, for like, you know, traveler's diary or something like that. Because sometimes I'll go out in the country for a week and, you know, if you got some bad water or you got Giardia, you, you could die without that. So there there is definitely reason for that. And um, some of your standard medications, um, they, they sometimes will do a replacement um, um, on a, you know, a, a noted basis. But... Um, I do recommend if you have the ability to get an additional 30 to 60 day supply of things that are critical to you. And uh, if you knew for a fact that it was going to be a long term situation, you would probably consider potentially cutting your dose if you knew you were going to be in a position where you would run out. Well, and that's what I've thought about. And, you know, just real quick, I, I looked through my cupboards and found some old scripts that were you know different dosages and and you know there's some meds that I don't have to take all the time but so I'm kind of just I'm saving up a few here and there just in case I mean again no more than a week or two but at the same time we got to think of these things no there's definitely a, a number of reasons and this is you know, this it's it's interesting to spark the conversation. And again, I don't I don't believe I've 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 been to these guys' houses. I don't think any of us are crazy preppers. You know, but it's uh, there's a difference between being paranoid and prepared. That's always the joke that we'd make. And um, it's a good idea to be prepared, and that uh, you can take that to levels that go too far. But um, having just being mindful of it and knowing that you know you, there's 
much more likely a natural disaster would cause a week of outage where, you know, if they've got no power and nobody shows up to work, that pharmacy ain't going to be open. You know, so if, yep. if you can't make it for two weeks, you, you should probably think about, um, you know, having something like that. So I think of the same way with my glasses. It's, uh, I've got a couple of spares now and I'm actually going to buy um, probably one or two more just because in a situation where your glasses are broken and you need a pair, that if there's no glasses, doctor, what do you do, you know? Man, that, that, that's, that's another really important aspect that, that I haven't thought about, too. And you can get cheap wow. ones just for spares. You can buy, you can order them online for twenty, thirty dollars. They don't have to be, you know. I, I wear, I hate to say it, I wear bifocals. <laughs> the glasses I wear are amazing, and I love oh, them. Oh man! But I could surely get by with a thirty dollars pair of glasses. Yeah, boy, I don't, I don't want to tell you how much my glasses cost. Dang, I, I've I've got such bad astigmatism. I have to go down like three levels in reduction of the lenses. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, I, what I'll add is, Brian, that's all very, very good, concise, and pointed, uh, you know, advice. That's really good stuff, man. Well, is that all? I think that's probably all we need to hit on that. We just wanted to talk a little bit about it because, you know, people are, people are really, really overreacting. And um, unfortunately, I, I think this has got a lot to do with the media pushing people into being fear mongers, you know, and that, that unfortunately seems to be what they are as an industry anymore. But, uh, anyhow, don't, uh, well, don't freak out. Well, Brian, I, I, I would say the media that they, they like to see the economy tank over issues like this. And maybe yeah. I'm taking that too far, but I mean, we had a real rocky stage in the stock market during uh, a lot of the media's hype. So, you know, man, mm-hmm. like uh, like Doctor Drew said, shut up, man. Just, yeah, our you know, local. Just, just keep it to the facts. Yeah, and don't sell your stocks right now. <laughs> yeah, no, hold on <laughs> to them. Stick, it's stick coming it out. Back. They, well, one, it wasn't a, that big a drop. Two, it's coming back. Um, our uh, local Costco had their largest day in 13 years, and that includes holidays. So that's a little disturbing. <laughs> I mean, good for Costco, wow. but people are just being people are behaving foolishly. So, sure. Yep. Well, what do you got next, Aaron? Well, I, I thought we would at least talk about this shooting that occurred at the Coors plant. Yeah. Um, now, I the, the interesting thing to me is that, you know, it, it was a real big deal, and we had politicians run out and start talking about gun control, and then all of a sudden you heard crickets, right? Wow, that's weird. And, it, what do you got? What do you guys think the reason is for that? Well, I'll 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 jump in there. I'm sure Eric's got stuff to add to, but the you know when when the stuff happens and it's unfolding, man, they are there before you know. And to, I hate to say it, but the, the truth is, they're there before the blood is dried, and they're already getting people wound up. No facts have been released. It's an ongoing investigation, and they're just there hyping what a horrible, terrible thing has happened. And I trust me, it is horrible. It is terrible. I'm I'm feel horrible for the people who were left behind from that. But as the facts emerged, it didn't really fit what they've been preaching and crying about. So I I think that's kind of why we saw that sputter out, you know, some of these other things where it, you know, either there was a, an individual that was radical or the firearm was a scary one, you know, they, those stories held in the media longer. And this one really, I mean, was just as severe as anything else that's happened recently, you know, in the past, I'm talking like the past two years, but that one, it, it seems like it fizzled in about 48 hours. Am I right? Oh, yeah. You, you made up a, you said a really good point. This is just as terrible as the other instances, but different firearms and not the type of person that they want it to be, it seems. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's a, absolutely my thoughts on it. You know, we could go into further detail, but, you know, I think that that suffices um, for the, the way when we want to hit on it. But but I think all three of us agree that the biggest factor in this is this is another example 
of a corporation, which let me digress for one second and say I'm a diehard capitalist. So when I talk about corporations, it's not um, the anti-corporations like uh, Bernie Sanders likes to talk about. But <clears throat> when you have corporations that disarm their employees, this stuff happens. And, and the employees that decide to take on this kind of action and murder people, let's face it, they've decided to murder people. They're going to do it however that they can. But, but when they, you know that this employee knew that they have a disarmed, uh, disarmed corporation and that he would go there um, unopposed. So let's face it, that's, that's part of the main takeaway is that these companies that um, have policies where um, they state that the employees cannot carry on campus or, or at work, that this is what happens. And, and frankly, because you allow your employees to carry at work doesn't increase the likelihood that a CEO is going to be shot. It, it actually decreases that this is going to happen. So, you know, I don't like being disarmed. You know, I think I've hit on this before. Um, you know, whom I work for, um, I'm disarmed. And and I don't like that. And, and I know that, that several of us in our audience and, and, and I know Aaron's kind of in this same boat. I, I mean, it's just not right because it disarms us from being able to protect ourselves from, frankly, when this happens, it's an individual that's murderous and they're, they're going to do what they're going to do. So we might as well have the capabilities to protect ourselves. So these corporations out there, if, if, if any of you folks are hearing us, just, just look at the, the actual empirical evidence um, having armed individuals unknown to anybody that's there can still carry um, saves lives, bottom line. Yeah, j- just think if, I know it's trite, but just think if one person that was being attacked or somewhere, someone nearby, the toll would have been reduced for sure. But, uh, I mean, we know this, but again, anyone that, that focuses on the gun, right, the individual that does it literally chooses to take one step after the other, continually taking steps to the car, home. In this instance, I think this guy went home and came back, right, because he got fired. It's all a succession of, of continual choices to go in that direction to commit murder, but we, we don't need to digress too much in that. But to me, guys, I, I don't know the answers to these questions, but is, is it a case of literally liability insurance because they allow um, people to carry on their campus? Um, is it, of course, I'm skeptical, and I think it's mainly about VIPs not wanting to get shot, as you mentioned, Eric. But do you guys know anything about issues of liability? At some point, at least in in businesses where where customers are allowed to come, those businesses cannot be held liable for someone that that is carrying if they have to um, use their weapon in self-defense on their premises, the company can't be held liable. But is there, have you guys heard of anything like that regarding companies and, and their employees? I have not, but I, it is one, an interesting thing that you bring up about the liability. And if the statistics show that it's safer with people carrying, then I would sure love to know how an insurance company could justify charging liability insurance or raising a liability rate for the firearms being on site because then they're actually just doing that based on a on a you know how it makes them feel not the actual dollar signs but uh, well not actuarial tables and right i mean that's why they have those they that's why they have actuarials to see what the what they should charge for items and, Mm -hmm. and they would have that information that's a really good point yeah um Fortunately, you know, there's never been a shooting where I work, but um, it wouldn't last long. Uh, I'm very 
very blessed. I, I do get to carry where I work, um, and I'm not the only one. And, you know, the, the, what stops a mass shooting is the time span between when it starts and the second gun arrives. And if you look at the news stories, that's, that's when they end, is when the second gun arrives. And if the second gun is on site and present, that time span is so much shorter. So if you want to talk about saving people and actually do something about it, removing guns from campuses and locations is actually the worst way to achieve it. Sure. And one last thing, and I, I've read and heard about stories, but I'm sure this is something our audience can, can look up. But as far as I know, um, people that um, our concealed carry permit holders are actually the most law-abiding individuals in society. But again, that, I don't have any sources to quote on that right now. But Well, we've definitely been through more background checks and had our records checked scrutinally than uh, the folks who just walk through and aren't. So that's, I can tell you that. That's true. <laughs> well, guys, I think... It's probably time to go ahead and change this show up um, to, um, do you guys have anything else to cover before we um, change our, our motive of the show? I'm good. No, no. Hey, man, let's get after it. All right, guys, like we talked about, I thought it would be a lot of fun to really take this show in a different direction and live by what part of what we espouse here is of course education in multiple areas and and tonight I'm talking about music. Now of course what is music? The key is that anything that you tap, right? You tap on a um, piece of wood or a um, a log or a door um it resonates at a frequency and it's just the laws of physics, right? It resonates at particular frequencies and if we want to get real nerdy there's there's harmonics and partials, etc. But, but the key is that humans decided to take those frequencies that they heard out of organic items and codify them into two pitches. Well, so I, f- I figured I would just give a real quick kind of a fun music appreciation, quick history of Western music. Now, of course, I'm not talking about Western as in, as in country and Western, although that does fall into Western music. But I'm talking about Western Europe um, development of contemporary music and contemporary theory. Now, of course, we could go back really far and talk about lots of styles of music like Gregorian chants and, and Renaissance music, etc. But most people are grounded in what they often think of as classical music. So Western music is mainly codified by dividing up the octave into 12 notes, which became known as the 12-tone equal temperament. Now, the reason why I bring that up, that is, again, the dividing of the physical octave, which is the doubling of frequencies that are heard in resonating objects. Um, Western theory decided to divide that octave up in 12 tones. Eastern music, Middle Eastern, it's usually around 16 to 18 as far as I know. And then in Asian culture, it was only five notes. But Western music chose the 12 tone um, scale but what most people hear as Western music, they think of classical music. Well, I just want to break that down just a smidge because that's a period from 1600 to around 1800. And that, of course, encompasses um, composers like J.S. Bach and Vivaldi, which were actually in the Baroque period. And then in the classical period, you had the most famous composers, Mozart and Beethoven. Those individuals were all from Germany, Italy, and Vienna, Austria. Now, if if someone wants to understand the difference between classical and Baroque music, here's a key. Do you guys know that um, that instrument that's at the beginning of the Munsters? It's called a harpsichord. Roger. Well, if you hear a harpsichord, it's from the Baroque period. Which, if you do not 
hear a harpsichord, it's more than likely classical music. So that may be something that people can key in on. That Western, we're talking about Western music, so we're talking about the influence of the European immigrants that came over here to the United States. So we, many people will know that there are definitely some distinctly American arts. Now, around the late 1800s, I'm going to kind of skip around here a little bit, but in the late 1800s, um, we saw the development of blues in the South, and then, of course, blues started influencing and growing into jazz. And just to be clear, those were both blues and jazz were both um, organic music styles that, that came out of the South and African-Americans. Blues um, basically influenced and grew into jazz. And then out of that, about that same time, we started seeing country music that melded with jazz and created a country western swing and then later on into the 50s we we had the development of bebop jazz and i just have to say something real quick here is that if anyone wants to know legit jazz and most definitely bebop are probably the most difficult music to play um, from a mental standpoint now i say all that to say to modern times here of course blues, jazz, and country all kind of melded into rockabilly and then into rock and roll. So that brings me to the first what's your favorite color question, guys. Now, I'm going to first ask you, Brian, Elvis or the Beatles? Beatles. Okay. <laughs> Eric, how about that? This is a very important question. It's, it's a personality test. Now, Eric, what's yours? Elvis or Beatles? Elvis all the way. Rock on. <laughs> is that your final answer? That is my final answer. That's awesome. Now, I'm, of course, a Beatles guy, too. But that's cool. You like Elvis, Eric. Now, if you'd ask me, if you'd ask me uh, the Beatles or Johnny Cash, that would... <laughs> well, guys, so... After that little introduction of um, musical his history in the, in the Western European sense, I thought we would, we often ask our, our guests what their favorite musicians are, and, and we thought it'd be a, kind of a fun opportunity to go ahead and delve in a little bit deeper since we have time and go down our um, top musician list. Um, what do you guys think? That sounds uh, fun. Brian? Do you have something you want to go into, buddy? Well, sure. I, since you uh, told me we'd be talking about this, I actually made a little. Uh, I made a little list, and you know we were supposed to keep it short, and I did keep it fairly short. But um, I'll uh, I'll give you I'll give you what what the what the fans probably expect and want to hear first. And uh, I'm pretty much all ladies all the time, and that uh, that accounts for almost all the stuff I'm going to talk about. So um, in one category, I've got uh, Metallica, Megadeth, and Iron Maiden. Now, in the category that I probably actually listen to more on a daily or weekly basis, I've got uh, The Smiths, The Cure, and New Order. And out of, out of those bands, I'm probably going probably gonna to go... New Order number one and Metallica number two, but uh, you know, there's uh, it's just got a lot to do with where I grew up and when I grew up and what I was doing. So you know that stuff all all stuck in there. But uh, you know, just to to talk about those a little bit, the uh, you know the Metallica stuff. You know, I've been a Metallica fan since their first album, the Black Album. Ever since that one came out, that's a little running joke actually <laughs> i was like what's he talking about me? <laughs> I, I own ride the lightning it's on my phone right now <laughs> i i All own right. barrage days i own <laughs> yeah anyway <laughs> there's a disturbing amount of metallica on my phone but uh no that stuff is uh and you know you talk about the classical stuff and you know a lot of their um 
a lot of their early stuff um, really was written in a classical tone, you know, and the the way that the Definitely. notes are constructed and selected, you know, it's not it's not just somebody grinding on guitar, you know. There's there's actual notes in there, and for a reason. But uh, going back on the other side, uh, New Order, which of course was a you know came out of the ashes of Joy Division uh, when, you know, Ian Curtis decided to kill himself, which is probably a pivotal, oh, well, obviously a pivotal point in the band's career. You know, things, things I think, tightened up and cleaned up a little bit. It was a little less sad and, and weepy, so I, I enjoy both, but uh, definitely New Order I would uh, probably pick over Joy Division. But I have had the opportunity to, uh, you know, go out and see some of this stuff in person, been to a couple of Metallica concerts, been seen New Order recently. Um, now, um, I also have uh, gone uh, to the other side and uh, actually gone and saw Peter Hook in the Light as well, and he owns the rights to some of that, you know, previous material before they parted ways, and anyone that knows about them will know that stuff. But um, the whole deal with... Uh, Ian Curtis killing himself and the concert that I went to um, actually at the Greek theater in Los Angeles. And I, I, I hate, sorry, guests, but I, I, I really loathe the politics of California. So I don't really go to California very often because of that. But um, I went there because it was an opportunity and they, uh, one of the songs they played, he said, uh, which was from the Joy Division days, he said, uh, we wrote this song to cheer Ian up. I guess it didn't work. And if you got the joke, it's dark. But man, uh, it was it was pretty interesting to hear him say that on stage. So pretty cool. Um, pretty cool to be there and see, you know, basically 70% of the original band still standing on stage and still performing, you know, th this many years later, as opposed to a lot of these other 80s or even maybe 70s groups that you see at a casino and it's one son of an original member and there's no one else there, you know, it's, it's, it's not even the, the band anymore. So pretty cool to do that. But, uh, a couple other things I'm going to mention real quick before I get done though. Uh, of course you got to throw in like beastie boys and, you know, I've had been on a little kick with bliss and SO recently. They've got some awesome lyrics. They're actually a, a rap band out of Australia, not a big rap fan. Um, but that they've uh, their lyrics and the way they present them really really move me so and something that I found listening to Jordan Peterson actually is a care of the dawn and he's actually created an entire genre called meaning wave and he's basically doing lo-fi hip hop with spoken word and um, he does stuff from Jocko he does stuff from Jordan Peterson. Um, there's just, he's, there's about a dozen people he's done stuff on and, and he just really does a great job. And it's, it's music that will jack you up because when you're listening to Jocko talk about, this is it, this is what I've waited my whole life for, you know, and it's set to a, a pretty, you know, catchy tune and, you know, he's going through like, it's, it'd be like a Ted, well, they did his Ted talk. They did a whole, uh, a whole, uh, thing where they broke it up into like three songs, but it's the whole Ted talk about extreme accountability set to music. And it's moving, man. The first time I heard it, I was like moved. I was like, wow, this is impressive. And I had heard that Ted talk. So it wasn't the first time I heard it, but set to music was just a whole different deal. So pretty neat stuff. And, you know, I think that's, uh, enough out of me, but there you go. There's my kind of eclectic, uh, collection of stuff I chose to share about tonight anyway. So <laughs> there you go. Well, what's awesome is that I was literally thinking the word eclectic. So that's cool, Brian. <laughs> when, when we when we had the fun chance of of getting to um, shoot on your range there when I was um, at, at, in your guys' hometown, we got to talk music. And again, I always love learning how much more of music fans. Um, the people that I meet are than I, for some reason, expect them to be, and you're one of those people. <laughs> well, so I guess I'll take a turn here, and I just wanted to um, start out by saying that, of course, music has um, has always been uh, had a really emotional pull to me, and and of course. To me, emotion in music comes from mainly 
the vo- the vocal melody. So anything I'm I'm really into more than likely has you know your standard great vocal melodies and you know great verses and great choruses to sing along and make you want to crank it up. Um, and then of course creative rhythmic timing. It just draws me to it when it's when it's definitely um, off the beaten path when it comes to the music musical rhythms. But enough about that. Now I, I figured I would go kind of in in reverse order here, and and I would start with with number six here. I'm going to start out with um, the guitar player Brad Paisley. Now you're going to of course hear a theme in my music. I am a guitar player, so there's a lot of guitar centric music. But so yeah, Brad Paisley. I, I I'll have to say about him. I'm not. I have not been a country fan really most of my life, and and I'm still not a country fan. But at the same time, Brad definitely made me get into some country even more. the The thing is, guys, he's one of the best guitar players on the planet when it comes to controlling the guitar and 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 just ringing the most out of it it's just pretty incredible and then at the same time he's such a great songwriter but i figured i'd list some albums here to check out um, his album play and his album american saturday night and then love and war those are all really good places to start if you want to check out some of his music you know again i'm a guitar player but one of my favorite musicians, and um, you'll Eric, you'll appreciate this. One of my favorite musicians is simply a drummer. His name is Matt Chamberlain. Oh yeah, yeah. He lives up near you guys, so um, one of these days you could run into him. But so Matt Chamberlain, first he came out of North Texas. He graduated from the jazz program there and started playing at Saturday Night Live, interesting enough. And then shortly thereafter, he joined the band front with Edie Brickell and the New Bohemians, <clears throat> which, by the way, I think that's one of the coolest names ever, even though I didn't really care for Edie Brickell, <laughs> but that's a cool name. But the main thing is that he has a feel. Not, I'm not talking about drum fills. I'm talking about the feel of his groove that, that is, is very unique. And um, his measure, the way he adds taste to the beats that he's playing, the uniqueness of his beats. And, and man, another thing also is, is simply the drum sounds that he uses. I know Eric doesn't dig it as much as me, but I actually like fairly loose sounding snares where where you can actually kind of hear the the strainer rattling and and the head might just be a little loose um, and you can even hear other drums um, kind of rattling through the recording. But again, one of my favorite things about him are his sounds. He may be one of the most recorded drummers in the last um, 30 years. Again, just real quick, so I named off who he played with, Edie Brickell, and then, you know, that huge Wallflowers album, Bringing Down the Horse, that, you know, had, I think every single song on that album was a number one hit. So, um, and then he had a stint where he played with Tori Amos, and man, an amazing album called Scarlet's Walk, which if I had to pick any album that had the best drum sounds um, I, I would probably pick that Scarlet's Walk, even though I've kind of moved on from Tori Amos. She's kind of gotten a little weird lately. Well, anyone that would suckle a pig. Dude, n- no joke. Even <laughs> though that Boys for Pele is a cool album. Oh, speaking of har- harpsichord, um, there's a lot of harpsichord on that album. <laughs> but back to so j- just real quick. So he... He's played with David Bowie, Chris Cornell, um, Peter Gabriel, and um, not not least of which, he also played on a really cool album with a, a friend of mine named Dan Phelps, that, who's also in Seattle, uh, an album called Modular. Man, some amazing drums, amazing guitar playing. So that is Matt Chamberlain. Now, number four... I have Harry Connick Jr. Now, 
I have to say, I really do believe all in all, I, I think that he may be the most talented person alive. Um, I, I know that's hyperbola, but I, I saw him live um, a couple of years ago, and it was the best concert I've ever seen. So much talent on one single stage, just not him, but but of course all of his his band that has played with him his basically his entire career he's had the same band and so that's got to tell you something about him he he must be pretty good to work with but i would say some albums to check out of his um would be she oh my nola and then a great ballad album called to see you but i mean that that guy full of rhythm and and just just amazing pianist um he's a lot of fun to listen to now eric you i think you'll appreciate this one um number three i have here is a known as a progressive rock band from texas called king's x get some now they are not really well known except for in the in the kind of rock music community but they have to be one of the coolest bands ever. Um, I mean, just in, just three guys that put huge music out, and every single one of them sings. And, you know, just amazing vocal melodies and lyrics and, and amazing guitar riffs and, and, you know, tight drum grooves. I mean, you've, got, you've got this this um six and a half foot tall black guy that that sings amazingly and and just thundering bass lines and i mean just an incredible band to check them out i would definitely look into their album faith hope and love and their album dog man which if i had to pick their magnum opus it would probably be dog man and then another later one called ear candy those are all full of killer music. Now I'm on to who I think, again, some more hyperbola, but I believe that, so my number two is the Foo Fighters. I consider them the greatest rock band ever. I know that they're in competition with the Rolling Stones and the Beatles, etc. but I think the Foo Fighters win, went out. Dave Grohl, man, he, he just exudes cool rock and roll. Um, and their, their first three albums, I don't believe there's a bad song on either one of them. Unfortunately, after, so, so again, those albums would be their first self-titled one, Foo Fighters, which actually is all Dave Grohl. But then they came out with Color and the Shape with, with all the great tunes like Hero and, and Everlong. And then their, their third album, Nothing Left to Lose, which it, if I had to pick a favorite one, it would be that one, Nothing Left to Lose. Again, amazing vocal melodies. That, that's the key, sing-along vocal melodies, but with some, some tight rock and roll. But one fun story is that a few years ago, um, I've got a connection that I was on my way to a concert here in Oklahoma City, and and I got a call on my phone, and it's this guy named Sean. Actually, I don't think that's his real name, but that's what he was going by, actually. <laughs> he said, hey, this is Sean. Um, he, he was friends with my guitar builder, more on him in a little bit. But um, he told me that you're taking your son to the Foo Fighters tonight, and I just want to let you know I'm, I'm waiting on you guys. When you get here, give me a call. I have some some backstage passes for you guys and and so we met him there and and they treated my son like he was the guest of honor and my son spent the entire concert sitting on the stage um right next to chris shefflett's um, monitor so uh, and then me and my wife hung out on the side of the stage and wa watched i mean literally probably the funnest night of our life our lives it was a lot of fun I feel like I'm going on a little too long here, but last, I will have to say, is definitely my favorite guitar player, a guy named Paul Gilbert. One of the best rock guitar players um, I can think of, but 
that wouldn't mean a hill of beans to me unless he, he could write songs as, as good as he does. If you could think of, basically, if you melded Van Halen and the Beatles, you would get Paul Gilbert. So, I mean, pretty amazing music. Um, one of the most pivotal albums in my life was Mr. Big's Lean Into It, which, yeah, he was a part of that band, Mr. Big. His solo career is is better even than than his um, stuff with Mr. Big, which another great album of his is Spaceship One, and then kind of a quirky album that's along the lines of um, Frank Zappa, an album called Vibrato, and then a really good poppy album called King of Clubs. So yeah, again, Paul Gilbert, my favorite guitar player, and um, actually, I might have mentioned this before, he is my guitar teacher online right now too, so that, that's pretty cool. So that's my top six that I wanted to delve into, but I, I just couldn't go without giving some honorable mentions here. Rage Against the Machine, a band called The Winery Dogs, then the jazz player Bill Frizzell, and then everybody's pop guitar player that they love to hate, John Mayer. So that, that's what I have. Eric, you got your list ready to go there, buddy? Sure do. And, and by the way, guys, um, Brian, you know, as uh, the audience um, may have heard this story before, but Brian and I met um, at a ham radio license test. So it's kind of cool history. But as I sit and, and listen to Brian's music, it, it even though I've known some of that, um, I sit and listen and think, well, you know, that explains um, Brian's, you know, kind of his mindset where he comes from and his his deep thought and, and intellect. So I, I thought that was really cool, Brian. Hey, thank you, man. So starting at the bottom of my list, um, I'm going to take the lead from one of our awesome guest recently. I'm going to break the rules. Um, with number six, I've got a two-way tie between a very influential band um, in my life, uh, Pantera. And you're going to hear a little bit of a theme. You know, folks know that I'm a drummer. Um, and I definitely grew up around kind of metal and and hard drumming. And and so that that's kind of kind of where... A lot of my influence is not as I've grown older. I don't listen to those bands as much anymore, but I'm still I, I can crank it up in my truck and still enjoy it. And remember my buddy uh, Matt Salyer um, and my brother coming to concerts with me. I mean, just really good memories and some of the songs we used to play with both the band that, that I played with with uh, Aaron and uh, Tony Benton. And uh, and Randy Pavlik in another band, you know, Pantera has a lot of good memories for me. The other portion of that tie is uh, Tool. Danny Carey is an incredible drummer, and still to this day, they finally released a new album. Um, c- couldn't believe it. T- oh, I think it was close to 12 years. I might have the math on that wrong. But, uh, yeah, so Pantera and Tool tied for six. Number five. Bar none, my biggest influence in my drumming uh, was Tim Alexander of Primus. So um, although Primus, I loved the music, I would say that I loved Primus because of Tim Alexander. Um, His drum sound, and it kind of hit on what Aaron said, yeah, I'm still, uh, I would say, stuck in the 90s with my snare sound. I like a you know, a five inch snare with a, with it tightened down as tight as I can get it, you know, which is kind of getting old sounding these days. But, Dude, it, yeah. it's still a cool drum <laughs> sound for sure. <laughs> but, uh, but I definitely enjoy that sound. And, and back when I played gigs in Tulsa and, and various bands, both with Aaron and, and my other buddies, uh, I, I, I was given the name Little Tim or Little Herb as his um, other nickname because I I must have emulated a lot of his style. But <clears throat> boy, I just have to interject, man. He he's definitely one of my favorite drummers too. Yeah, still a big influence, and I almost had the chance to take some lessons from him uh, a little while back. He was um, teaching just north of uh, Seattle. 
but I went on a couple of work trips um, when I was trying to arrange it, and then he stopped offering lessons. So I need to see if he's if he's doing that again because he got busy. I think he started playing with Primus again for a little while. But um, moving on, I'll also digress one second and say that these bands aren't just what my favorites are per se. They're also um, some big influence on me and good memories. Um, although they may not show up in my playlist as much anymore, I, I would have to say that U2, um, Joshua Tree, the album Joshua Tree has to be one of the most important albums in my life. You know, growing up with Aaron skateboarding in, in Tulsa, you know, U2 was just, uh, it was, it was prolific on the radio and, and, and I still listen to with or without you. And, and I, and, and it brings me back to, um, to that time. Um, so yeah, uh, that's a perfect album. Yeah. It's, it's definitely still in my playlist, uh, today. And uh, so that was number three. Number two, I get to break the rules again. Um, I got another two-way tie. And uh, this happens to be my favorite guitarist. And uh, so the, these two bands got a, a little bit of radio play um, and, uh, and just incredible musicians and uh, ha- had some superb memories um, going into every show that I could go to with these bands. And the um, first band was uh, the Madisons and, uh, and Lucid. The, you know, those were um, Aaron's <laughs> uh, badass bands that he was in in the, in the Tulsa, Oklahoma area. And, you know, I, I would say, it, Aaron, I probably was uh, one of your guys' biggest fans. You probably saw that. but uh, Man, uh- that's awesome, and and as you said that, I was like, "What's what's he talking about here?" And then and then you throw that out there, man. I appreciate that, you know. And I do remember a ton of times looking out there and seeing you. Um, at some point, you you might have been dancing with a girl. I don't remember, but. Um, but you're always hanging out. I remember seeing you at Kane's Ballroom when we were playing there with, um, I think, Caroline Spine or something like someone like that. But yeah, I mean that, that's really cool. Thanks, Eric. You're very welcome, man. You guys, uh, you know, had, you know, I, I think when we were in high school, we we're like, hey, man, if we could only um, play with Ed Goggin. You know, next thing we know, you know, Ed Goggin is your singer in the Madisons. And, and I'll say this, I mean, when to hear you guys play um, with or without you sounded as good as you too, man. And, and, and deep down, man, uh, was such an emotional song to hear you guys play. Um, cool. Yeah, that, it was fun playing that. So um, m- moving Thanks. on, my favorite band has been since, you know, I discovered drumming and I discovered drumming, um, from this band and uh, that's Metallica to this day. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so mm-hmm. Meta- Metallica is, is my favorite band. Absolutely. And, you know, I've had some incredible memories through the years. Um, our cousin Jeremy Davis, a shout out to him. Don't get to see him much anymore, but uh, Aaron and I would hang out with Jeremy just cruising around a town in his truck listening to Metallica. Um, Master of Puppets. Yep, Master of Puppets for sure. Ride the Lightning was in the rotation then too. But, uh, you know, we played a lot of Metallica songs growing up together in our bands. And uh, so, yeah, still to this day, I mean, uh, my main gym playlist includes a lot of Metallica. And I would say that the, some of the best memories I have recently was with my son, where I took him to his first concert when he was nine years old in Buffalo, New York. And that was the uh, Death Magnetic Tour. Um, and then uh, I took him to the Hardwired Tour in Seattle um, a few years ago. 
unbelievable shows, and those guys uh, do it for me for sure. And I uh, hope that uh, it comes off as not being too uh, meatheadish, but th- those are my bands. Man, oh, I got to... I got to dive in and follow up on that, dude. That cool, cool stuff on the Metallica too. I mean, it is it is a big deal. But um, I love you bringing uh, uh, Pantera up because wow, I mean, they are just so raw. And I mean, the whole story with Dimebag and everything. I mean, uh, it's it's unfortunate that he's not around to be on Aaron's favorite list of uh, guitar players but you know the the history between him and Eddie Van Halen and all all the stuff that happened and after the fact is just like if you if you don't know anything about that that is some rock history that is like man that it's touching what went down there but um well and it, I just don't want to forget to say this because you brought up um Dimebag Daryl yeah that freaking tragedy man the yeah. the interesting so two things we can't we can't forget to mention mine and Eric's band name, the tactical twins. Yeah. Right. But, <laughs> but, but, but we being together and, and a brother and a, a brother guitar player and then a drummer together in bands, it hits home when you hear about Dimebag Daryl and, and man, his brother Vinny yep. sitting there playing drums when his yep. brother was, was shot right in front of him. Unbelievable. I mean, that, and you know, I was not a huge Pantera fan or a um, huge Dimebag fan, but he was amazing. But um, the fact, and, and but interesting enough, I was at quote um, referring to King's X. I was at a King's X concert, taking my son to a concert in Dallas, and Vinnie Paul happened to be there, and that was right before he died. So, you know, that was pretty sad. But on a fun note, Eric, do you remember that night when um, I was actually at sitting at home with a, a stick in the mud girlfriend at the time and you had an extra Pantera ticket and you called me at the last minute, man, I need someone to, to, to use this ticket. You want to come? Dude, I remember going there and and had you know neck pain from banging my head all night long. Remember that? Oh, I remember it very well, man. I was so glad you showed up there, man. Um, that was a blast. Um, I think that was the, the Far Beyond Driven tour, wasn't it? I think so. Whatever it was, man, it was it was some tight, heavy rock and 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 musicians and know what i'm talking about when i say tight so but yeah awesome man that, that's good good topic and and i have to double down on metallica although i'm not a huge fan of metallica these well, i'm a fan i don't listen to them a lot these days they are the reason i play guitar um when i heard and i it was long before i even started playing guitar when I heard battery and and right before the bridge, there's this part where they're literally just holding two chords. And I, I, man, that is the coolest thing I've ever heard in my life. You know, just holding that chord. I don't know what they're doing there, but that's freaking cool. So eventually, yeah, I, I picked up guitar because of that. Get some, man. Fun topic. <laughs> yeah, fun topic. Guys, you know, we were going to talk about some some gear that we use but man we've we've been a little long-winded you, you guys think we need to go ahead and get into accountability favorite piece no don't skip it aaron favorite piece of gear okay i have some guitars built by a guy named saul cole who is out of portland oregon he's built me several but my favorite one is is one that i ordered from him that was a um, an amalgamation and a tribute, again, to Paul Gilbert. I took several of his guitars and kind of amalgamated them and had Saul build them, excuse me, build it. it it's, it's an impeccable guitar with one-piece Swamp Ash body, um, DiMaggio um, Air Classic pickups, roasted maple neck one piece roasted maple neck um a 
a real copper pit guard. I mean, just an amazing piece. I'll, maybe I can remember to to share a picture of it on our our social media. That's my favorite piece of gear. Well, well I'll, Eric? I'll go ahead. And, uh, yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, I would say my current favorite piece of gear I have is my snare. It's a uh, it's a Tama Star Classic Maple in racing green. As far as I know, the five inch. With the racing green, it was a one of a kind, um, and so that that's uh, they opened that color for a very short period of time, and not a lot of folks were getting it, and uh, and that's what I understand. So I, I think that is in fact a, a one of a kind. Now that said, you know I, I play on a you know an awesome kit that I picked up from a from a good friend when Aaron and I were playing in one of our church church bands back before I joined the army, which is just a, a mid-level um, premiere kit. It still sounds great. And for the audience out there, the the closing song, that's that drum kit, um, including that snare. I love my um, Zildjian A custom cymbals, but I will tell you that I've been intending to complete a motif of uh, Adrian Young of no doubt he's a drummer i really respect i really liked his style um kind of that mixture of uh, reggae and rock and he had a a green snare along with a kind of pearl white kit and i still have wanted to complete that motif and i think i'm gonna make that happen this year with either a, a silver sparkle star classic or or dw kit in maple shells gotta be maple um, Dude, God made maple trees just for drums. I agree, man. I agree. And, and or the pearl is fine with me, but either one of those two colors is going to complete that kit. I've been intending to, to, to um, do so. Yeah, man, that's, that's it for me on favorite gear. Well, awesome. I'll, uh, I'll take, I'll take a turn, even though I'm not a musician, but my favorite, my current favorite piece of audio equipment is my Thunder Beast Ultra 9 6.5 suppressor. It just makes the sweetest <laughs> sound when, Dude, when in use. Dude, great. <laughs> so. Man, it, it is resonating at frequencies, and I'm sure has some harmonics going on. Yeah. So, I mean, that, well, that yeah. technically well, could Aaron, be music. Aaron, actually, um, I've heard it. And and it resonates at freedom. Yeah, <laughs> it resonates at the sound of freedom. <laughs> awesome. Yep. Yep. Very good. Good talk, guys. Well, so do you, do you now? Do we want to jump into accountability? Who wants to go first here? I think we better. Yep. Go yep. for it. All right. Well, I'll take it. I'm, oh yeah. Uh, go ahead, Brian. I'll try not yeah, to be too ahead. greedy here, but I had a busy week. I'm going to be a less, a little less formal than normal. Um, so uh, I, uh, I did only get to CrossFit once last week, and I only got to Barbell once last week. But uh, the, the thing is, I'm going to talk about kind of my whole week. And um, starting out, uh, and this is the previous previous Saturday and Sunday. We're coming, we're coming into a new week here, but. Um, I actually had a silhouette match and this doesn't usually happen, but they were uh, back to back. So we had one at a local range and then at another local range, we had uh, another one on a Saturday and a Sunday. So I got to shoot 22 small bore um, silhouette two days in a row, got a second and a first in those deals. So I was pretty happy about that. I, you know, I should have, I should have had better scores, but I was very happy with, uh, with where I finished out. Um, And then Tuesday, um, another local range out here in Shelton, we've got, they run a uh, two gun event and uh, cause it's an indoor range, pistol only. Um, we get to run pistols and pistol caliber carbines. So it's very much like any other, you know, like it's like a three gun event with no shotgun, but um, we get to do a transition and move through a stage and actually, you know, move and shoot and switch guns. So um, that was very cool to get to do that. I've uh, I've done it before, but I've been kind of taking a hiatus from it. I'm going to try to get back to that. So calling myself out on that one. Uh, Wednesday, I went uh, to jujitsu. Um, that was my um, normally I go on Tuesdays, miss that because of the match. So got in there on Wednesday, Thursday. 
non-real training related, but uh, Thursday I uh, hopped in a private plane with a friend of mine, and uh, we flew up to Friday Harbor in the San Juans. It was a gorgeous day. It was just a it was just a bluebird day, and we flew back just before dusk uh, um, and watched the sunset over the Olympics. And it was uh, man, it was. I mean, it was epic. It's one of the things that you you know you just you will you'll remember for a lifetime, you know, and it's not like it's the only time I'll ever get to do it, but it was just, it was just incredible. Um, Saturday was uh, the organized promotion day at uh, Jiu Jitsu at Dynamics with Professor Will. And everyone comes to class and does normal class. And it was a, it was a fundamentals class. There's a lot of people there. The room was full and uh, we've started doing a few open roles at the end of class. And, you know, we usually do two or three depending on time. And Will took it upon himself to uh, use all of the time and some extra. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> we I think we it was either seven or eight roles by the time we were done. And let me tell you, I was just absolutely ruined. And they started the promotions and, you know, they did the they did the the youth first and you know, I've been doing this for about seven months now, and I've been going pretty consistently two to three times a week, and I got my first stripe. So that was like, it was a really awesome. cool deal, man. So I'm that, made my month, that, man. <laughs> that uh, that Saturday to Saturday was just what an epic amount of stuff that I got done there, man. So cool, man. You did get some stuff done. That's awesome. Yeah. Good times. Well, uh, well I, you want to jump in there, Aaron? Sure, I'll go ahead and go here. Um, I'll try and make mine quick. Now, so I did actually squeeze in a pretty good cardio workout this week that was specific to cardio. I, I keep doing walks with my family, but I did do, a, again, a, a really good cardio workout. I need to squeeze those in more than I have been. I did get two jujitsu sessions in. Now, my gigging season is is wrapping up, so I am getting geared back up for jujitsu because I want to go ahead and test for my um, combatives belt, which is, if anyone's um, familiar with the way the Gracie system works, the first main test is when you get to the point where you can test for your combatives belt, and, and I need to do that because... I need to catch up with my wife because she tested on Saturday and passed. So get some. <laughs> she, oh yeah, I, I'm proud of her. Again, it's it's great having her because she's better than me. So she, I like going to class with her because she helps me. But now, just real quick, so I I have not missed a day of dry fire at all. Woo. And I've been doing yeah, and I and I've been doing slightly shorter. Um, times but i've been doing it usually about three times a day and i wasn't going to say this guys but my here's my new my new trick you know most of the time you got to wake up in the morning and you shower and you shave and then then you also well you know sit down for a little while i've been dry firing on the toilet (laughs) fair enough I, I I have my I have my blue gun sitting there in the bathroom and man, why not get some reps if you can't go anywhere? Right? I mean you're trapped there. <laughs> so I, I wasn't gonna say that, but hey, there you go. That that's well, one of my new secrets. That's just, that's one of my three times a day. Use, use some of them Lysol wipes when you're done. <laughs> I, I do. I do. Well, so then real quick. I did another IDPA postal match. I can't remember if I talked about this before, but technically that is a national match because um, basically every IDPA club in the country, or most of them, shoot the same set of stages. And I'll tell you, they're, they're pretty darn hard. And the interesting thing is I did really well, thank God, in several of the stages, being, you know, actually a top competitor in some of the stages. But um, then other stages I did fairly poorly. So that inconsistency brings me... uh, But I I just have to say it was a great match. I did two guns again, both my 19 and my 17 in the um, ESP division and the concealed carry division. And amazing enough, 
my raw times on both of those pistols were within, I think, less than a second in total raw time. So that so that was just pretty interesting. But so because of, again, those inconsistencies, I went to the range two times this week. First off, shooting the drill, but also I just sat there and shot, filled up magazines, and I shot the best groups I could at five, six, seven, and ten yards, um, just basically moving it out there. And and it tightened up my shooting. I'll tell you, I'm going to keep doing that for a while because I'm I'm not seeing the sight picture that I need to for these shots. So that's all I have. I guess we can talk about the drill here in a little bit, guys. Yeah, so I'll go ahead and take uh, accountability now. So as far as my dry fire regiment, I have uh, I've hit it every single day of this week, and thanks to Brian who shipped me uh, my cert pistol. Man, this this cert pistol! I cannot believe I've waited this long to 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 um, get one. And and man, I I'm thinking it's a game changer for me. It, it does have some differences between dry firing with your live pistol, and not live as in live ammo, folks. Just in case that's misunderstood, but my actual pistol, but there's so many benefits to having this cert pistol. I've been really enjoying it and been doing things from the the Todd Green fast drill, the um, David Blinder dot tor- torture drill. Um, those are two good ones, and and doing some transition drills. So it, it's been really, really a, a good thing for me to have that cert pistol. I only nice. was able. Oh, thanks. By the way, Brian, just thank yeah. you very much, man. It, it, and you're right. I mean, I same way. I can't believe I waited this long. Yeah. Great, great tool. Sounds like I need to get one, too. Yeah, you do, Aaron. To, to have the trigger reset alone is uh, invaluable. So I was only able to make it to jiu-jitsu once this week. Um, I came down with a... I, I you know traveled to a couple of new places, new allergens, and and caught, you can probably hear it in my voice a little bit. Uh, another sinus infection, and folks are a little bit leery of you being on the mats with uh, coughing and and hacking these days with the coronavirus. So um, I went ahead and extricated myself um, off the mats for a few days. Uh, that said. I've been getting a lot accomplished with the X Guard guys. I think it's going to really pay dividends. Um, now, granted, some of the folks that I have been sparring with, um, they're you know anywhere between you know experienced white belts to to a blue belt. The other day that I was um, pulling some some X Guard on, but if they don't know, if your opponent doesn't know X Guard, it's going to give them fits. Uh, not that that's necessarily amongst your training partners but the point is is x guard got some awesome applications that that folks wanting to advance should be doing now x guard isn't new it's been around a long time but i just i kind of eschewed it for a long time um but speaking with cecil birch um when we had him on the show made me want to seek it out and, and learn it better so i've uh, been pulling off some pretty good x X guard sweeps and you know sweeps to passes so reading wise i've been reading um jocko's new book leadership strategy and tactics uh fm and again again thanks to brian man for sending me that book brother awesome really appreciate that i had uh Three early morning workouts um, consisting primarily of chin-ups. I finally broke some plateaus in my chin-ups and dips, so that's been nice. And uh, kettlebell circuits, that's been my primary workouts this week. So I think that pretty much wraps it up for me. And I'll end with saying, Brian, you know, meeting you several years ago and us deciding to go on this venture, um, seeing you get promoted to your first stripe in jiu-jitsu, which is jiu-jitsu something that that I've loved for many years. And, you know, my business partners are all in jiu-jitsu. And seeing you get promoted, man, pumped me up, man. It it made my month, man. Congratulations. 
Nice. I appreciate that. And it is yet 100% uh, the influence of you guys that got me in there. So pretty cool, pretty cool to be doing that. So yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Congrats, buddy. So do we want to move on to the drill of the week or we're going to do accountability with the drill, right? Yeah. Let's talk about the drill. Sure. Who, who do you want me to explain it and then I'll give it um, yeah. give my scores, Brian? Yeah. Okay, just a reminder, everybody, this was the four, five, six, seven drill um, from pistol.training.com. First off, it's a six inch circle, and you got 20 rounds, it's at seven yards. And um, so that's it's a six inch circle. It, it has a theme for the four, five, six, seven. I digress now. So the first string is draw from concealment and shoot five rounds. Second is draw from concealment, five rounds, strong hand only. The number three string is from the ready, five rounds, support hand only. And then number four, you repeat string one. Now, I was a little bit nervous going into this drill at first um, because it is a challenge. I, I did normally, like I do normally, I went through it three times, but I, I don't want to get too too bogged down in all the the numbers and everything I, i'll just say this i am um, like this my first couple of um, runs were not pretty i um i got basic in both of my first runs basic rating but i had a progression and then i finally ended it with um all four strings zero points down with a um raw time of 16 seconds so i got in there in the intermediate ranking. So I was pretty pleased with that. Um, but that is a hard drill. I want to do it some more because it, it can tighten your skills up for sure. Now, how about you, Brian? Well, uh, you've uh, crushed my hopes and dreams. Uh, <laughs> good good <laughs> job, man. That's, uh, that's impressive. Uh, you really got some great times in there. And uh, you know, I well, uh, I'm not trying to crush anybody, man. Yeah, no, that's that's impressive. Um, so I I shot this again with my 365 appendix, you know. So I'm shooting a small gun, and I took I took the time to make the shots count. And I shot this with my friend Shannon again, and uh, we both, you know, were were pushing ourselves probably faster than we needed to. But I uh, I was able to squeak in a 29.93, so I was under under 30 seconds. But the uh, the thing that, uh, you know, really, really hurt me was the misses, you know, and it's, I think, I don't think I had more than, uh, two or three points per, per round, but, um, I only had, of the, of the total times we shot, I only had one or two that were clean. So that means that I'm still, and I even talked about this last time, I'm pushing myself to shoot too, too hard, you know, it's, uh, it's becoming, I think, counter counterproductive to do that, and it's not uh, it's not really it's not it's not helping. You know, I'm going I'm going way way too fast to get the zero down. But um, it is a hard drill, you know. And I, I did notice that uh, it really had to uh, I had to work a little bit harder on on getting that time slowed down by not missing but you know it's something that th practicing at that distance and shooting quickly you know um we did some single draws you know and i can get i can get a shot off in the six and you know less than two seconds that's easy but getting those other you know four shots off in the six inch circle in you know Five seconds is not as easy as it sounds like. So, um, you know, and you've got to do that in all of them uh, to get to that, like kind of that 18 second is intermediate, you know. So, no, I'm proud of you, uh, Aaron, for uh, doing that well. So I did not uh, did not perform crazy, you know, but I uh, no, but definitely got her done. Two, two things. You're shooting your your smaller carry gun now. If I would have shot this with my 42, of course I wouldn't have had these these scores. I shot. I take note of that too. Every time I do these drills, this I was shooting with my main carry gun, my my 19. Mm -hmm. 
I will delve into this a smidge. Let me show you this progression. I had all of my all of my raw times were right at about 16 seconds. So 15, 9, 8, 15, 8, 6. But the first round, I was eight points down. Yep. Then the, the next one, three points down. And then zero. So interesting thing, literally, I mean, with tenths of a, you know, tenths of a second within the same time, I'm going from eight to minus zero. That's what, you know, this drill, obviously, if you, you key in on it, you can tighten it up. But, yeah, I mean, it was a fun drill. Fun drill. Eric, do do we have another drill ready, or are we gonna repeat this one? No, no, we're 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 gonna we're gonna do another drill this week. And what I'll say is is that I had one drill planned, um, but but I decided to shelve that one for this week because of um, some of your comments about <clears throat> you know being on the clock all the time. You know, it's not it's not valuable to be on the clock all the time. Um, and this will be a recurring theme within EvoSec, and that's the B8 bull. We're gonna yeah. we're gonna we're gonna slow things down, and we're gonna go to ten yards again. We're gonna slow fire as long as it takes ten round groups. You know, you can shoot you know two three groups of ten, and uh, and let's see what we can we can do accuracy wise at ten yards this week. How about that, guys? Man, per- perfect. That sounds awesome. Perfect. Yeah, that, that's what I need to do anyway. So, that perfect drill, buddy. Okay, so I think that about does it for this week, right, guys? Sure does. L- yeah. Long show. We can we can all sure gab quite a bit. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> I guess that's why we have a podcast, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, w- well, I'm I'm going to let you guys go then. Um, Always great to talk to you guys. I'm thankful for for being able to do this with you guys, and I never dreamed it would go to where it is right now, so I'm ecstatic about it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, as Eric mentioned in the beginning, reach out to us, um, crew at evosec.org, C-R-E-W at E-V-O-S-E-C dot O-R-G, we will respond. We'll get back to you. And, you know, if you've got something you want to ask about or elaborate on or call us out on, tell us we were wrong. Hey, any of that stuff. And uh, exciting, exciting things on the way. I think we're going to possibly be giving away some more Tenacore. We are definitely negotiating with Origin right now. I might yes, be letting sir. the cat out of the bag a little. but No, that's just <laughs> fine. Uh, some good stuff coming. So stay tuned. Awesome. Well, you guys have a good evening. All right, man. Yep. Until until right. next time, guys. Y'all stay stay safe out there. Audience, stay safe out there. Take care. <laughs> <laughs>